This is Gas Exchange and Respiratory Disorders Part 3. This is my description or my analogy of um, respiratory illnesses. If you think of the Disneyland balloon here on the left with Mickey's head inside the outer balloon, um, we, and then the one on the right, we have atelectasis of Mickey's left ear. That atelectasis can happen because of pneumonia. So if you put a plug, as you're blowing up the inner balloon, put a plug inside there so no air gets into Mickey's left ear. His left ear doesn't enlarge, doesn't fill with air, and you get atelectasis. atelectasis. Um, but the pneumonia is inside of the inner balloon. So all we can do is antibiotics to break it up the germ or kill the germs, um, turn, cough, deep breathe, break that stuff up, mobilize it, get it out. In um, pneumothorax, hemothorax, uh, our problem is that we have something outside. So it's inside the outer balloon, but outside of Mickey's head, and it's pushing down on that ear and collapsing the ear. So you're still going to see the atelectasis. That ear is still not inflated, but it's because we've got a big pocket of something, fluid, purulent fluid, blood, air, that's pushing from the outside. That's when we use a chest tube. A chest tube goes in between the two balloons, right outside Mickey's head, inside the outer balloon. Of course, your lungs are not shaped like this. Realize <laughs> this is an analogy, um, but that's when and where we use a chest tube. So now moving on to non-infectious disorders, um, epistaxis. This is a bloody nose. So what we want is to have the child sit upright, pinch their nose, leaning forward. The problem is people will pinch their nose and lean back, which just lets it run down your throat. So it can take up to 10 minutes to pinch. And right, kids are sometimes not very uh, smart. Um, when you pinch the nose, tell them, open your mouth, breathe through your mouth, because uh, they're probably already a little panicked, and then uh, you pinch their nose. But if you really keep that nose pinched for 10 minutes, there are very few uh, nose bleeds that won't stop from that. If it doesn't, then you should go in. But if you can pinch it for 10 minutes, um, it will it will usually stop. You can put some ice over the bridge of the nose or a cool cloth, right? Slow down the blood flow there. Um, ways to prevent nosebleeds is to not let the inside of the nose dry out. So putting a little bit of Vaseline inside the nose, especially at night, or your water-soluble um, lubricating gel, and then running a humidifier at night. Um, foreign body aspiration. Kids are most at risk between one and three years of age. Uh, if a child comes in struggling to breathe and they do an x-ray, realize only things that are radiopaque show up on an x-ray, so it may not show up. This can be life-threatening, and this is where we're going to put down a scope, grab whatever it is, and pull it out. Um, it shows different degrees of obstruction there from mild to complete, but remember um, in complete obstruction, no air is moving, which means the child can't cough, they can't talk, you only have minutes to to act. Um, so that one is life-threatening. At Children's, there used to be a big board. I think it's still somewhere up in the operating room area of all the things they've taken out of kids' airways, and they are crazy. I mean, there's coins and um, buttons and things like that, but there's also things like knitting needles and um, all sorts of crazy things. The only, um, of the whole board with all those crazy things, the only thing that the child died from was the latex balloon which is why they don't allow latex balloons at Valley Children's. They um, are a problem if they're aspirated. Uh, so how are we going to prevent this? Well, avoid toys with small parts, especially kids who are young and still putting things in their mouths. Coins, buttons, those little things that are just the right size to go down the, and block the airway. Um, peanuts and popcorn, things like that, until they 
eat well, have teeth, have good coordination with the, the chewing and swallowing, those should not be given as snacks. Too high a risk of of aspirating aspirating them. And then chopping food into small pieces. And for foods the again, we've gotten all sorts of crazy things out of kids, but the ones that they die from, hot dogs. They're the perfect size and shape to totally occlude the airway. Um, so cutting hot dogs into little little pieces. Um, and then harmful liquids as well. And that can be not just the liquid, but the fumes from the liquid can do damage. So now let's talk about some chronic respiratory disorders. Um, allergic rhinitis, asthma, chronic lung disease. Uh, we used to call this bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Uh, we've kind of changed the term cystic fibrosis and apnea. So allergic rhinitis. This usually has a family history, right? Everybody in the family has allergies. Ask them what works because different people are different. What we're allergic to and what helps um, can be different. But this is the, they, they call it the um, allergic salute. There's kind of a white line right across the bridge of the nose from rubbing it up like that. And then the dark circles under the eyes. Asthma. And we'll spend a long time on asthma. Uh, this is a chronic inflammatory disorder of the airways. Uh, on kids, you'll often see they call it reactive airway disease because it's in the reactive portion of the air, which means down in the, the lower airways. Part of that is we don't want to label somebody as asthma because asthma is considered chronic. So the first asthma episode that hopefully as they grow and everything gets bigger, it won't happen again. So if we don't, um, if we aren't sure that this is a, an ongoing problem, we'll call it reactive airway disease. So really that's the same thing as asthma. So what happens, you have recurring episodes of wheezing, breathlessness, chest tightness, and cough, especially at night. We have restricted or limited airflow and that air trapping where you can breathe more in than you can get out. And then the bronchioles overreact, bronchial, bronchial hyper responsiveness. So there's really three parts to the pathophysiology of asthma. One is inflammation and edema. Uh, so swelling of the inside, the lumen of the, the bronchi swell. We're going to treat this with our corticosteroids, right? Bring down the swelling. Um, that is not an immediate response. It takes a little while. You also get increased mucus in there. So it's going to take less mucus to totally obstruct that because it's already narrowed. So increased mucus. We're going to treat this with hydration. Turn, cough, deep, breathe. Um, again, don't give them cough medicine. Good coughing. Um, so, and try and prevent it by knowing what their triggers are or, uh, when they have an upper respiratory infection that's already increasing the, the mucus um, to treat that fairly quickly so that they don't turn, that doesn't turn into asthma. And then the third thing is the spasm, the bronchospasm, where the smooth muscles around the bronchi and bronchial squeezes. And that is what our albuterol, our rescue inhaler, um, prevents or, or treats. And to prevent it, we're going to use the, the, uh, mast cell stabilizer, leukotriene uh, antagonist to try and prevent it from doing that. So we've got the increased inflammation, increased secretions, and constriction of the uh, smooth muscles around the bronchi. And here's kind of a picture showing all three of those things. So we're treating as many more using this stepwise uh, treatment. So step one, this is for somebody with intermittent asthma. Step two, they have mild but persistent asthma. Step three, moderate. Step four, severe. And uh, there are descriptions of all those different stages and recommended treatments for them, including things like inhalers. Notice he's using a face mask. A child who can put their mouth around the mouthpiece can use just a regular uh, arrow chamber, but a child, uh, an infant who 
can't follow those directions, we can use the mask or somebody who can't coordinate, you know, actually the beauty of the arrow chamber is you don't have to coordinate the, the squeeze and the inhalation. Um, we really want kids to use those arrow chambers because it does hold it there. It prevents it from hitting the back of the throat where it gets swallowed where you, and you get all the side effects without the therapeutic effects. Status as asthmaticus, this is a asthma attack that does not respond to anything. So respiratory distress continues despite vigorous therapeutic measures. And this is when we want a child to come to the emergency room. What they usually do at home is not working. They're getting worse. They come in. We can give them epinephrine uh, subcutaneously and we'll continue with the albuterol treatments in doses that we do not want them giving at home. Um, so, and there often there's another infection that's triggered the asthma, so we need to treat that. So, how are you going to do this? Calm nursing presence, right? Anxiety is going to make them worse. Uh, this is physiologic, but anxiety can trigger it or worsen it. So, you need to be calm to help them be calm. We need to see what their pulse ox is doing. Um, we want to have them sit up in whatever position is most comfortable, and usually it's sitting up, kind of leaning on a table, and then allow the parents to remain with them to comfort them. All right, so uh, he's got a face mask on. We use a lot of continuous albuterol, which is basically, I mean, it would be like you're continuously doing treatments. Um, if we're going to do that, they have to be on a monitor because we are going to see increased respiratory or sorry increased uh, uh, heart rate the pulse and he can play around in his room as long as he's feeling up to it and has the energy to do it so our goal is to avoid those bad exacerbations because they actually do damage to the lung and that doesn't go away you get remodeling scar tissue in there know what triggers it and avoid those things relieve um, episodes as quickly as we can so we don't do that permanent remodeling and damage. Um, relieve the bronchospasm because that can be life-threatening. Monitoring those peak flow meters will give us early warning if they're starting to um, have some respiratory problem before we see symptoms. And then teaching kids how to use their inhalers or the families if they're too young so that they really can um, manage things at home. Here's the peak flow meter I was talking about. They blow into it fast and hard and measure how much our goal. We, we set this based on their best and our goal is to have them up in the green. If you start seeing it drop down into the yellow. The parent may or have orders of what to add or they call the physician and start adding things. If it gets down into the red and down here we're at 50% of what they usually can do, it's time to go to the emergency department. And here's just one sample of the direction. So we may have a kid who's on inhaled corticosteroids even when they're in the green zone. Um, or we may not. They may add those when they start to see the yellow zone. So it's going to be based on that child's uh, experiences. Um, cystic fibrosis. This is an exocrine gland dysfunction. Really involves everything, but the biggest problems we have are respiratory and GI. Uh, it is the most common lethal genetic illness among Caucasian children. This is autosomal recessive. You had to learn about these uh, genetics, I know, in biology. This is why, because it matters now. So that autosomal recessive, recessive means both parents are carriers. They each have one normal and one abnormal gene. If there are four children, one will get the abnormal from both parents two will get the one of each, a, a normal and an abnormal, and one will get two normals. Okay, th so there's a one in four chance of getting the disease, um, but that is ev there's no guarantee that for children it's going to happen like that. Every pregnancy has a one in four chance of developing, of actually having cystic fibrosis.